Hi, I'm Ben Toner, Founder and Managing Director of Numerous Networks, a consultancy set up specifically to help organizations bring convergent technologies into their network. In this presentation, I'm going to talk you through what convergence is all about and why we need it. I'll be looking at the 3GPP ATSSS. I'll look at other convergence options which are challenging such solutions. I'll also look at how you may be able to try convergence today on your own devices. And finally, we'll be looking at the modes of convergence and how it can help you in your everyday operations. To get started, let's look at a real world example of where convergence is happening. BT, a UK operator of mobile and fixed broadband services, have pledged to make convergence happen. Howard Watson, CTIO of BT, has said seamless, consistent connectivity is what BT is striving for. Convergence is really about providing predictable network services at a predictable cost and predictable quality. It should not cost any more than we expect to pay for our services. We should not have to care about what we're connected to, and we always expect to perform at a minimum standard which we are paying for. There are a number of scenarios in our daily lives when we move between networks of various qualities. All the while, any single network quality can change and fluctuate. Our primary networks in the home, office, our cellular networks may vary from time to time. We have network transitions as we leave home, move to cellular, move to the office, step into a coffee shop for lunch. Here are some of the everyday examples of where convergence is important. If you get in your car and start your Apple Music on your phone and then drive away, as you move away from Wi-Fi and transition into cellular, there's no need for an interruption. Convergence can save the day. Moving along the street with spotty Wi-Fi, we call them dead zones when you end up out of range and not able to use that network you're connected to. If you're using a voice or video call and move in and out of range of Wi-Fi, you might get a gap, the call might drop. When you are at home and your 4G signal is great but your broadband signal goes bad, you might want to use that 4G signal for all of your devices. In fact, you could even use innovative technologies like making your mobile device supplement your broadband technology. In any case, as Wi-Fi drops, we should use cellular and vice versa. Now to define convergence in its simplest form. It is the use of multiple networks to deliver a combined or otherwise converged network, which is capable of providing the end user with access to the data network at a consistent quality level, which they expect and is relevant to what they pay for. Convergence is important to the way we use networks from now on. Therefore, many bodies are helping to conclude on standards which will allow the various components and implementations of convergence to interoperate. The ITU is specifying convergence to ensure global interoperability for fixed mobile convergence. IMT 2020 Fixed Mobile Convergence Network is required to support traffic switching, splitting and steering between fixed and mobile access networks. The Broadband Forum specify the architectures and procedures for building a hybrid access network for both fixed and mobile access. 3GPP specify the ATSSS, the Access Traffic Steering Switching and Splitting function. Specifications for multipath protocols such as MPTCP and MPQuick are specified in IETF, and many other service delivery focus groups such as 5G XCAST are reviewing the implementations from a service delivery point of view. Taking a closer look at the ATSSS specification within 3GPP, specifically the 23 5XX series are important. 501 discusses the system architecture of hybrid 3GPP, non-3GPP access using ATSSS. It covers, from an architectural perspective, the multi-access PDU, how to establish multipath connections and control it with rules and quality control measures. 502 details the ATSSS procedures, including the multipath PDU, session establishment, and network performance measurements, and 503 defines the policy control for ATSSS. 23793 is a technical report which looks at some of the technologies likely to be used in future implementations of the ATSSS.
Now I'll take a look at how ATSSS and convergence is really implemented and likely to be implemented in mobile devices, specifically starting with steering. The device will steer between mobile and Wi-Fi networks as it sees fit, and many devices use their own internal logic to do so. The logic is usually defined around using multiple networks in a way which is simple to the end user and removes a need or a decision from the end user. All the complexity of selecting the network and managing the choice is automatically handled, usually according to some governing rules within the device. So let's define a specific industry term now, which is steering. This is the procedure for selecting an access network for a new data flow. Switching and splitting take network decisions up to the next level. They both depend on the use of multiple networks in a combined way. We are seeing this in some devices and in home access gateways now. Most notable is Apple's use of MPTCP in Siri, Maps and Music. Decisions around how to direct traffic are currently still based on end device decisions and in Apple's case, are tuned to the needs of the specific application. This makes sense. The decisions to move traffic are towards delivering a better user experience, notably avoiding drops, load latency for quick responses, improving data rates, and load balancing across the access technologies. Let's define the terms used in ATSSS. Switching is the procedure of moving an ongoing data flow from one access to another, and that usually needs to be gapless, some kind of way of not losing any data during the switch over. Splitting itself is a procedure of splitting the traffic of an ongoing data flow across multiple access networks. This usually ends up being on a packet by packet basis and gives the best or most granular aggregation concept. In order to use multiple access paths, multiple sessions need to be established. And for the case of splitting, they both need to exist at the same time. A key concept for enabling this multipath networking is the multi-access packet data unit, as defined in 3GBP 23.793. An MAPDU session can be established by the UE if it's capable and needs to do so, or by the ATSSS itself if some network knowledge indicates that a multipath session would be better at that moment. Release 16 of the 23500 series make an initial specification for ATSSS. At the higher layer, that is MPTCP, and at the lower layer, that is ATSSS LL, which uses no additional protocol, so is only really usable for steering and not for splitting. 23793 technical report proposes additional concepts for convergence, many of which have been used and are favored by particular vendors. Those options are null tunnel, which is just flow steering based on a five tuple and is the only suitable method for ATSSS LL. GRE tunnel, where a tunnel is set up on each access. Multiple access can be used at the same time. Trailer based GMA appends trailers, which can be used in packet reordering, making this, te this technique suitable for splitting. L4 multipath options are also defined, including MPTCP as used by Apple and in the ATSSS solution provided by Tesseres. Quick and MP Quick, which have a lot of promise, but ITF are still waiting to finalize a specification. SETP and UDP generic, which can be seen in various forms and available as open market apps for smartphones today. And more on that later. Looking at some practicalities, it is important as a lot of the technical options are not used widely or have no limitations. MPTCP is a good solution and Apple have adopted it. It is also available for OpenWRT and ATSSS solution providers have SDKs for it. However, it has a few known issues which can be difficult to manage. It also does not work for UDP data and therefore does not help real-time media or conferencing applications. MPQuick holds promise as a good alternative to MPTCP but needs to be finalized in ITF. It is typically on the roadmap of vendors who use MPTCP today though. ATSSS LL is required for all Ethernet PDU types and can be used for any protocol, but it is limited to basic steering as there is no scope for additional convergence protocols. However, due to its simplicity, something similar has been seen on some access gateways 
and also mobile devices to perform simple serverless flow steering to prevent devices getting stuck on badly performing connections. Interestingly, the specifications do not go into convergence between the public and private 3GPP networks such as CBRS. This is important for MVNOs who are using dual SIM, dual standby, or DSDS devices, and they are currently working hard to solve the problem of discontinuous connections as the network changes. I'd now like to introduce the generic UDP convergence options. They are mentioned in 23.793 technical report, but this provides no real detail, leaving most of it up to the solution provider. The benefit of this technology is that it can be implemented at a high enough layer so it can exist as a mobile application. There are a number of vendors offering similar solutions in this space, and the fact that multiple similar solutions exist mean the technology has a lot of benefits. It is my opinion that this makes a generic UDP a real contender in this space. There are three ways this approach tends to be deployed. Two on mobile devices, either as an SDK built into an application and managing the packet flow over all the available IP interfaces directly from the application source. This is similar to MPTCP and MPQuick. Or, alternatively, solutions out there today can use the device VPN service to capture all of the traffic and then distribute packets across all the available IP interfaces. Home gateways or access points are also supported as the vendors provide an SDK and a server to enable this solution here. There are some great benefits from these solutions as they have been built over years using a lot of real world trial and error and do work on the open market today. Namely, while well, all traffic types are supported, congestion control is usually re-implemented based on normal standards but is also optimized to use links which have different characteristics, such as latency. Enhancements such as forward error correction are added, something seen in UDP-based VPNs and the Quick protocol, so becoming the norm. Encryption is available, but at an overhead, so it affects max throughput, but sometimes that's what we want. The solutions are also tuned for real user usage today, performing gapless handover on UDP streams so that no data is lost during network transitions, while also aggregating for bandwidth on TCP. For those wishing to try convergence applications today but can't build their own, there are a few applications on smartphones which implement the different protocols available. For multipath TCP, you can use NetReactor Tester from Tesseres on your iPhone. Contact them for more details. For multipath quick, there is a multipath tester available on the iTunes store. Source code is also available for this. Proprietary UDP is available from a number of vendors, however many are closed source and many are not even available for open download on the application store. The one that is available most of all and worldwide is from Connectify and it's called Speedify. Look it up and try it, there is a 2 gigabyte free limit. Back to the ATSSS specification now. Rules are used to define the steering, switching and splitting which should occur for various traffic types or destination. The steering modes in the rule cover active standby, smallest delay, load balancing, priority based and we'll talk more about those in the upcoming slides. The rules are created by the ATSSS based on knowledge of the network but also path performance reports from the UPF or the UE. If a path develops an issue, a new rule will be created and sent to the UE and the flows modified. Again, more on that in the upcoming slides. As a practical point, however, early attempts at rule management using techniques such as ANDSF suffered from device vendors resisting service providers' desires to have such control. Device vendors want the customer to be in control, which is mostly right. So it's my belief that there still needs to be further discussions on how to include user preferences. Also, Apple and Android have invested a lot in managing networks for the optimal user experience. So it may be wise to get them involved now so that a usable standard is developed and adopted. As just mentioned, Path performance measures are taken periodically on both the uplink and downlink as they may be asymmetric. 
The measures include access agnostic measures, which include RTT, jitter, packet loss, and access specific measures, which would be RSRP, RSRQ, and SNR for 3GPP, and RSSI, bandwidth, the Wi Fi technology type, such as Wi Fi 6, and BSS load, etc., for Wi Fi. The traffic distribution functions execute the ATSS rule while the path performance is measured. This can be either active or passive. When a performance measurement report indicates a rule needs to change, the ATSSS will send out a new rule. Logic is required to make sure the unwanted state transitions do not occur, such as rapid steering choices, which could cause continuous back and forth changes between 3GPP and non-3GPP, which would be noticeable by the end user and a very bad user experience. Now we will look at the modes of convergence, or steering modes. There are five altogether defined in 3GPP. First is active standby. A typical fallback scenario, such as a home broadband router. The primary access is preferred, unless it's failing and can't perform. Priority based is next. Certain traffic types can be assigned to a priority network. Addition of the low priority access occurs for new flows if there's a performance impairment or the primary link cannot provide sufficient capacity. In this case, both flows can end up in simultaneous usage. The best access mode. When the user choice may not matter, e.g. a user has an unlimited data plan, you can use the best network, which could be the smallest delay network which is measured in real time. So this is not specified by a rule per se which network to use as a priority, but more in real time which network gives the best performance. Then the secondary network can be used as an overflow to ensure a minimum service quality or a bitrate and bandwidth. Note though, such a technique may appear to be optimized, but it can also be confusing for the end user. If their traffic normally goes over Wi-Fi when in the office, but one day the office is busy with a lot more cellular and Wi-Fi traffic, a user may well notice this, find that they've used a lot more on cellular because it was the better access, it wasn't their choice, they don't know what happened, ends up complaining. Another mode is redundant. All traffic is copied in this mode. Rare, but found today in some of the over-the-top applications offering gapless handover. Redundancy would happen during a transition period where the primary network quality is below standard. At that time, traffic would be replicated and the best packets selected to avoid disruption. Finally, we have the load balance mode. Data is split between the access on a percentage basis as defined in the ATSSS rule. This is likely to only be suitable for non-GBR flows. Thank you for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please contact me if you have any questions on ben at numerousnetworks.co.uk. The links here will take you to some of the backup information used within this presentation.